continuing on with the female reproductive system, um, I want to talk about the organ known as the uterus. In this picture, you're looking at the uterine tissue in the middle here. In the middle there, that's the opening, and it's referred to as a potential space. And that potential space just simply means under normal physiological circumstances, there's really not a space here. When do we get a space? We get a space typically during pregnancy, which even though that is a normal physiological process, it's not the normal for an individual. It's something that happens nine months during a pregnancy, maybe three or four times or more for most individuals are on average. So starting from the very beginning here, the very inside, we're going to work our way out and we're going to talk about the different layers and, and just identify the uterus anatomically in a little better detail. So it is a hollow or bladder like organ. Or it has the capability of being a hollow or bladder like organ. Normally it is not. The space that is uh, maintained by the uterus is shaped like a pear. Really, it's, it, it looks more like a, an upside down pear. So here's the uterus proper. And it uh, has kind of that upside down um, pear shape. During pregnancy, this is going to be the site of fetal implantation. So remember, fertilization occurs in the uterine, the uterine duct, or uh, the fallopian tube or the oviduct. And about three or four days later, that fertilized egg comes down and it's going to implant in the uterus. And then we're going to continue from here with growth. So we'll have fetal implantation and we'll have growth. Now, when you look at the uh, the uterus, the wall of the uterus, what you're going to find underneath this parametrium, this is that outer covering of the tissue, of the tissue you're going to find two types of tissue. You can actually see them really well in this prep. Um, you have sort of this material up here that sort of looks um, kind of darker pink, and then you have this tissue here that's much thicker in distance. There's um, openings there. Those openings, by the way, are just simply vessels, uh, and, and it's a lighter pinkish color. So there are two types of tissue. And those two types of tissue are going to support the process of fetal implantation and then fetal growth and then eventually parturition or the birthing process. So the two types of tissue are going to be endometrium and myometrium. The endometrium is what's on the very inside, that lighter pink color. The endometrium is comprised of epithelial cells, cells that make up glands, which we're going to call glandular cells, and then we also have connective cells. So we have this epithelial glandular connective tissue. There's also a heavy blood supply, as you can see pretty clearly in here, all of these kind of little openings around here. Those are vessels that have been, that have been exposed in cross-section. So we have a large number of blood vessels. This is the actual tissue site for implantation. So we know that implantation occurs in the uterus, specifically happens here in the endometrium. And it's going to be that 
site of contact between the fetus and, mo and the mother, uh, this is going to help to form, the, the endometrium is going to help to form the placenta of pregnancy. So help to form the placenta of pregnancy. And as such, it's going to be a nutritional depot for the fetus. It's going to be the site of waste removal. And will also be the point of gas exchange. So through the development of the placenta using this endometrium, we can provide adequate glucose and other nutrients to the developing fetus. We can remove the waste products that are being produced from that fetus's metabolism. And then also this is where we're providing oxygen and removing carbon dioxide. Now the outer layer of tissue is called the myometrium. And the myometrium, every time you see MYO, hopefully you remember that that's referencing muscle. So this myometrium or this outer layer of tissue in the uterus is a layer of smooth muscle. And what you need to remember about smooth muscle is the way that the cells are oriented, they kind of have that squamous shape or kind of a flat, kind of spindly shape. And they get oriented in a variety of different directions inside of, this, inside of the tissue to make up that myometrial tissue. And when they contract, they don't contract just in one direction, they contract in a variety of different directions. So very different from skeletal muscle. But this becomes really important because we're going to use the myometrium for a couple different things. First, it's going to allow for flexibility. So we have implantation basically at about the 8 to 16 cell stage, which is very small. But eventually we have to grow the speed is hopefully up to something like 7, 8, or 9 pounds, which is quite a bit bigger than that's 8 or 16 cell stage. So this allows for that growth to occur, that flexible growth that's still structured. So we have the flexibility, but also the structure during fetal growth. In addition to just allowing that flexibility to grow for that cavity to expand into the cavity of the uterus of pregnancy, after about 38 weeks on average, that myometrium is going to provide the force. Those smooth muscle cells are going to begin to contract in response to a myelin of hormones, and it's going to provide the force for parturition. And that term parturition, again, is just simply the process of birthing a child. So if we go back just a single picture here, we have this cavity here and kind of this pear shape. This is where implantation and growth is going to occur. But what you'll notice down here is the uterus comes to a narrow towards the uh, towards the inferior aspect of the uterus right before we get to the vaginal canal. There's this narrow. So this narrowing occurs. And this part of the uterus is specifically called the cervix. And it's going to be, the cervix is going to contain an opening. There, there's a, an opening that we can get to from external 
more from the internal or to come down from uh, from inside of the uterus, and that's just simply called the os, O-S. So you have the internal os coming out to the vaginal canal and the external os leading into the vaginal canal. So all of that to basically say that the cervix is what's going to contain the opening from the uterus into the vaginal canal. It is through this opening, the cervical opening, that we permit or are able to permit sperm delivery. But at the same time, can aid to protect the uterine cavity itself, right? So this is a very precious part of the whole birthing process. The uterine cavity, this is the chamber where the, where the baby's going to develop. So we want to protect. But remember, fertilization is almost impossible, but because of a lot of the things that uh, have been created to happen, it becomes very much more probable, right? So the the Sperm has to be delivered and has to make its way up here into the uterine duct to deliver or to fertilize uh, a released egg. And the thing that's really interesting here, one of the one of the physiological responses that occurs during arousal and during um, during the sexual intercourse is that that cervical opening will actually tilt down, or the cervix itself actually tilts down, and it it basically optimizes the interaction between the cervix and where the uh, where the sperm and the semen is going to be deposited. And so we increase the probability that that's actually going to allow sperm to enter into the uterus, make their, make their way into the, uh, the oviduct. So it tilts down right to where all of the sperm is going to be which really increases the probability that sperm are actually able to travel into the uterus of the overflows. So from the uterus, we enter into um, the vaginal canal. And the vagina is a multi-purpose organ. So it's a multi-purpose organ. One, it's the organ of sexual intercourse. Second, it's going to act as the birthing canal. So acts as the birthing canal during parturition. And then the tissue itself of the vaginal wall is going to produce lubricant. So you'll remember from our discussion on a male reproductive system, one of the things that happens is we have this mucus that's released from the bulbal urethral gland that flushes away acid residue from the urethra and also lubricates the urethra for efficient movement. Well, after sperm delivery, that lubrication basically is no longer effective. That's to, to affect the, the male urethra. This tissue in the vaginal canal begins to produce a lubricant as well as a response to arousal, and that allows also efficient movement of sperm or helps to aid in efficient, efficient movement of sperm into the uterus and then hopefully up to the oviduct where fertilization can occur. So everything that we've talked about here with female reproductive anatomy up to this point would be considered internal genitalia. There's also external genitalia. And what I'm, oh, one more. I'm giving you sort of the cross-sectional view here, but we're focusing in on 
and the external surface. Collectively, the uh, external genitalia is referred to as the vulva, and it consists of two openings that are maintained, or I'm sorry, consists of an opening that's maintained by two different muscles. And those muscles are the labia muscles, and we have labia majora and minora. And these muscles, which you can see represented right here, are to open or maintain proper structural opening into the internal genitalia. In addition to the vaginal opening and those two muscles that help to support or maintain that vaginal opening, there's also some additional axillary tissue. And that axillary tissue that's present is primarily there for the sex sexual response. And so this is going to include axillary tissues which um, are found on the, uh, on the most anterior, uh, superior aspect of the external genitalia, including the clitoris. And then there's also some, some glands that extend out uh, around the, the vaginal opening um, the, that, that are very similar to the, uh, to the tissue that we actually find in the, um, the penile tissue. So um, also floods with blood during arousal um, and, and helps to maintain uh, proper opening of that vaginal tissue for um, intercourse. So primarily this external genitalia, axillary tissue, um, you include tissues such as the clitoris. Now, the one thing that's very different between male and female reproductive anatomy is that there are separate entryways into the reproductive system and separate entryways into the urinary system. In males, urinary system, male reproductive system share the urethra. In females, the urinary system is independent. So the urinary system is going to be independent. So juxtaposed to the male reproductive system where the urethra is shared, in females, superior for the most part, although it's not necessarily always superior, but for most women, females, um, the urethra is superior to the vaginal orifice. And will be contained in the external genitalia. Now, in this picture, you also can notice that uh, so here's our urinary bladder. This is the urethra. It's superior to the vaginal opening. You'll notice that the uterus sits on top of the urinary bladder. This compresses the urinary bladder, which um, actually decreases the effective volume of that particular chamber, that, that particular bladder. In terms of um, the female reproductive system, this is the halfway point. Female reproductive dis reproductive system is designed basically to take a fertilized egg to help it grow, mature into an infant, and then you have parturition, the birthing process, and then the second part of the female reproductive system is going to take over, which is going to be the member transition. And this goes from sustaining the child in the uh, uh, nutrient-rich uterus to now sustaining the child with uh, mother's milk. And so we're going to pick up there now with memory tissue.
males. Okay, so what we have here is a cross section through the mammary tissue. You'll see muscle behind that skeletal muscle, that's pectoralis major. Uh, and then in front of that, you have basically adipose tissue that's indwelled with these lobules and indwelled with the, with the, um, with the actual mammary tissue itself. So when we talk about the mammary tissue, we're, we're actually talking about tissue that's contained within the structure known as the breast. Now, the mammary tissue is not required for fetal development. So it's not required for fetal development. It is going to be very important in infant survival. So if breastfeeding is not performed or is not utilized, you need an alternative method, right? It's not something that you can just go without. If you don't provide a baby milk for um, a prolonged period of time, up to a year or two, we have a lot of issues with uh, development, especially brain development, eye development. A lot of the organ systems don't go through that early developmental process. So this tissue here, and, and in particular mother's milk, becomes very, very important for the survival and um, normal development of the infant. Now, the mammary tissue responds to changes that occur at fertilization. So we have this response that occurs because of things that are happening due to fertilization. And we're going to talk a little bit more about those um, those changes, those things that happen in, in just a few minutes. But first, I want to um, just in, identify some of the, the basic anatomy. Um, the mammary tissue, the external portion of the mammary tissue is the nipple, and then surrounding the nipple is this darkened area of skin called the areola. And this particular tissue is going to contain smooth muscle, which will assist in um, delivery of milk, but also to provide structure for latch on, which is when the baby actually latches on or grabs on to uh, the nipple and then begins to suck. So, nipple's going to provide that structure for infant suckling. The areola, this kind of darkened tissue that surrounds the nipple, um, it's actually really important too. When babies are born, their eyesight is really, really poor. They basically can just kind of distinguish contrast. And by having this darkened tissue, baby can't see mom. Baby can't see, okay, that's the nipple, that's where I need to, to latch on. But they can tell the difference between the different types of tissue. And so it helps baby to latch on and be able to be made. It's basically a part and it says, this is where you need to latch on. And so baby latches on to that area and begins the, the breastfeeding process. Now, the breast itself is primarily composed of adipose tissue. Primarily adipose tissue. Okay. 
Good. So primarily adipose tissue that is going to be supported by fibrous connective tissue. Now contained within the adipose tissue and the, the connective tissue, we have the mammary tissue itself. So the breast and the adipose tissue contains the mammary tissue. And really the mammary tissue is a modified sweat gland. So it's a modified sweat gland. That means it's an exocrine gland. You remember that term, exocrine? These are the types of glands that actually have the ducts, as opposed to endocrine, which are ducts and just interact through the capillaries. So it's a modified sweat gland. It's, it's a, an exocrine gland, and that means that we produce a substance that we call mother's milk that is going to be released into a ductwork to be delivered to an external opening that's contained within the nipple. Modified sweat gland contains oh contains a modified sweat gland or contains modified sweat glands. Really, it's many glands. So these modified sweat glands produce a modified form of sweat called milk. And that's right, I just called it a modified form of sweat. Is that really milk? It's a modified sweat. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that so much. So yes, every time you have some cow's milk by their cereal in the morning, you're consuming modified sweat. Yes, the almond sweats a lot. <laughs> so within the uh, the, the um, mammary glands, there's also going to be some cells mixed in there that are are contractile cells. So these are are cells. They're called myoepithelial cells. And they basically are able to contract and they aid in milk expression, which is just the term that we use to basically signify delivery of this material through the duct system to the external opening. So, what you can see here are these little lobules that are all connected to ducts, and then we have this sinus here, and they all converge onto the nipple itself, and it's the opening. So those ducts that are present are what take the milk that's being produced here in these individual lo lobules. The whole thing is a lobe. Individually, these are lobules. And so then the, the duct uh, takes that milk being produced in those in those lobes and it helps to deliver it to the external opening in the nipple. Okay, let's talk just a little bit about production. So the production capabilities of a mammal to produce milk is called lactation. So the production capabilities will be lactation. And the capability to lactate is actually developed at puberty 
but is not called on until pregnancy occurs. Okay, so just the capability is developed at puberty doesn't mean you hit puberty and you start lactate, right? You hit puberty, you now have the capability to begin the lactate because lactation is going to be called upon at fertilization. So when, when fertilization occurs, we have a milieu of estrogen and progesterone that increase. And these increases in estrogen and progesterone actually go towards helping to successfully establish a pregnancy. But the mammary tissue that's developed at puberty has the capability to begin to undergo lactation is going to respond. So that tissue is present at puberty, but doesn't fully function until we receive estrogen and progesterone at high levels for a prolonged period of time. So estrogen and progesterone stimulate the process and the increase in the size and the production capabilities of for uh, for lactation begin to occur when that cue is received. So estrogen and progesterone stimulate the process basically begin to cause milk to be produced, but we don't begin to express it just yet. We're beginning to produce milk, we're beginning to increase the function, it's a gain of function in that mammary tissue. The, the actual expression part of lactation occurs through two other hormones. One is prolactin which is going to continually cause supply to be created. The other is going to be oxytocin. And oxytocin is responsible for what's called milk letdown or ejection. So we have this hormone called oxytocin. And oxytocin is known to be what stimulates milk letdown. Lactation, or the production of milk, is stimulated by prolactin. The development of the memory glands themselves to be able to fully produce milk occurs because of estrogen and progesterone. So when do you probably want to start breastfeeding? Anyone have any idea? as soon as possible after birth. So in other words, it's very important to have the mammary tissue primed and ready to go to begin to produce milk and to shortly thereafter birth have milk able to be delivered to the baby. We want to hydrate, we want to provide nutrients and sustenance. So it's very important that that process begins very early after birth. Oxytocin is what's actually going to also be responsible for uterine contraction. So oxytocin, this hormone released from the posterior pituitary gland, actually cycles down through the bloodstream to the uterine tissue, also affects the mammary tissue, causes contraction of the uterus, causes upregulation of the process of lactation, and by the time baby's born, we should be within one to two days of successful, efficient rescue. So oxytocin is going to be that hormone that starts the process of parturition, starts the birthing process, and also gives final preparation for delivery of milk. Every time baby latches on after birth, you have a neural circuit that leads from basically a neuron leading from the nipple 
into the brain, into the hypothalamus, interacting with the hypothalamus to release oxytocin through the pituitary gland into the bloodstream to stimulate the letdown of milk from the um, lactiferous sinuses and from the lungs. So um, oxytocin is, is produced basically in a positive feedback. Baby begins to suckle, increases oxytocin release. Baby suckles more because now they're getting milk. More oxytocin is released, and that cycle continues until baby's full and stops suckling, and then oxytocin levels begin to drop back down. So I've given you a really quick overview of female reproductive anatomy. Let's deal with some of the physiology. And the main physiology that occurs in the female reproductive system is the menstrual cycle. Now, why do we call it a cycle? Well, because it has no beginning and end. It just continually cycles like a wheel on a bike for a cycle. The menstrual cycle itself is going to be um, comprised of two linked cycles. And those two linked cycles, so menstrual cycle, it's really two cycles that are linked together. Those two different cycles uh, are basically going to be de dealing or detailing what's occurring in two separate tissues. One's the uterine tissue, and one is the ovarian tissue. So these two link cycles are actually going to occur simultaneously. So occur simultaneously and are centered around the ovarian tissue and the uterine tissue. In the ovarian tissue, we're basically looking at a cycle of producing maturing and releasing one to two ovum or one to two eggs every cycle. So the ovarian cycle deals with the release of the egg. The uterine cycle occurring simultaneously alongside the ovarian cycle is a cycle uh, to prepare the uterus and in particular the endometrium to accept a fertilized egg. So in other words, we basically have the ovary, which is producing the egg, and then the uterus that's producing a conducive environment, a, a friendly environment for implantation of a fertilized egg. On average, the menstrual cycle is about 28 days. But in all reality, you've got pretty big standard deviations around that average. Um, I've heard it's even low as 15 to 18 days and as long as 36 to 40 days. The average just is about 28 days, and it is a repeating cycle. So that 28 days repeating cycle has quite a bit of individual variability from individual to individual. This cyclical process is initiated at puberty and will continue something known as menopause. For most women around the world, the uterine cycle, or I'm sorry, the uh, menstrual cycle, rather, ovarian and uterine cycle collectively, will continue from puberty all the way to menopause, but will have some interruptions. The number of interruptions is going to depend upon the number of pregnancies. Which you make a loss. So every time you have a pregnancy, if it goes the whole nine months on average, 38 weeks, 
uh, to 40 weeks. That's nine weeks, 38 weeks of interrupted menstrual cycle. And then we even have some time afterwards um, where we have some interruption as well due to breastfeeding. In other words, it's very, very rare for a new baby to be born 10 months after another baby is born. I've heard of 11 months, but that's even really, really rare. It's a lot more common. Most of you probably have siblings that are 18 to 20 months apart. And that's not because your parents are like, oh, we can't have a kid right now. They probably literally could not have. Um, is no longer fertile for a few months, six, eight months after pregnancy. So she was working on breastfeeding. That's not very conducive, right? To grow a baby, and to breastfeed a baby, very energetically for So it's not very conducive. So we have this natural mechanism to shut down the ability to become pregnant. For the most part, they're breastfeeding. Not that women don't get pregnant while they're breastfeeding, but they don't get pregnant typically within the first couple, couple of months. This whole process is going to be regulated by hormones. So the whole process is regulated by hormones. What you're looking at here is two linked cycles. So what's happening in the uterus? We go through this process of increasing <clears throat> the width of the endometrium. We basically go through a process of increasing the width of the endometrium, which increases blood supply, increases nutrient, it increases oxygen uh, availability. And then in the ovary, we go through this process. And it's drawn here in a cycle. It really happens just in one location. But we go through this process of taking individual cells that uh, will differentiate, similar to what we're seeing with spermatogenesis, go through a variety of different steps until they get to this thing, this, uh, this thing called a graphene or a mature follicle that releases the ovum. And then we have the scar tissue that's sort of left over afterwards, <clears throat> after we have eruption from the ovary, the ovum erupts from the ovary, get the little scar tissue because it's left over, and then we continue to continue the cycle. So it's regulated by hormones. Um, the figure that I'm going to show you here is pretty intense. This is a very classic anatomy physiology figure. What you're looking at there is two different, um, two different sources of hormones, four different hormones in total. So we have basically what's happening in the pituitary gland. LH and FSH, luminating hormone follicle stimulating hormone, are both going to be involved in moving the process, especially in the ovarian cycle, moving that process forward. And then we have estrogen and progesterone, which are being produced in the ovaries and within the reproductive system itself, that are going to help move the uterine cycle forward and to go from a, a very thin endometrial lining towards a very thick nutrient-rich endometrial lining that's very, very conducive for fertilization to occur. So the whole process is going to be regulated by those four hormones. <clears throat> FSH is follicle stimulating hormone. FSH. LH is luteinizing hormone. LH, estrogen, which you may or may not know already that estrogen, there's, there's actually no such thing as estrogen. There's no hormone, it's just estrogen. Estrogen is actually a class of hormones. And in particular, the estrogen that is involved in regulating the uterine environment is an estrogen called estradiol. And then our fourth hormone is going to be progesterone. And I know progesterone is very critical in helping to establish and maintain a pregnancy. So what you're looking at here is basically the plasma concentration. How much of these hormones do we find in the blood 
given a 28 day cycle, so about halfway through, you're going to see that we have a really big increase in both estrogen, FSH, and LH. So we have these changes in the levels of these hormones that equate to the observable physiological changes. That are occurring. Now, this pattern that you see here is a cyclical pattern. You have the increase in these hormones about halfway through the cycle, right around day 14 or just before day 14 every 28 days for the average. Okay? When is this when is this pattern established? It's actually established during the fetal stage. And it's the default. And what I mean by that is everybody sitting in this room right now, you are on a trajectory all to become female. If you're male in here, you have a Y chromosome. And that Y chromosome is actually what's going to lead towards masculinization. But you're going to be pretty surprised as to how we go from this cyclical pattern, because remember I told you males, it's every... 24 hours. And it's pulsatile. So we see luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone and testosterone levels spiking every 24 hours, once a day. And so it's pulsatile rather than cyclical. Why are you, first of all, why are you all programmed to be human? To begin with. It's the environment that you grow up in, they're in fetal development. You're being exposed to mother's high levels of estrogen. Because what we're going to see here is both estrogen and progesterone levels during pregnancy actually remain elevated for a prolonged period of time. So you are exposed to very high levels of estrogen. So in a lot of different tissues, you're being exposed to estrogen. But there's one tissue in particular where estrogen cannot really have an effect in one of the genders, and that's the brain. Estrogen cannot affect the brain in females. Estrogen actually affects the brain in males. Females have a, um, a very low amount of testosterone. Males have a very high level of testosterone. Testosterone easily crosses the blood-brain barrier and can be converted into estrogen. Estrogen is actually captured up on this protein called alpha keto protein. Alpha keto protein holds on to the estrogen. It allows it to cycle every place except for into the brain, in both males and females, and it has a variety of different physiological effects. Testosterone is not held up on alpha keto protein. So testosterone circulates freely and enters into the brain. Low levels in females, so very low levels in testosterone in the brain in females, very high levels of testosterone in the brain in males. That testosterone doesn't have a direct effect on the male though. It has to be converted into estrogen. We have an enzyme called aromatase that takes testosterone, converts it into estrogen, and as you get that increased estrogen exposure in the brain, which only happens in males because of the high level of testosterone, it begins to masculinize the hypothalamus. And we go from having the cyclical pattern, which is the default, to having the pulsatile pattern, which is not the default. Estrogen. Uh, it's still having an effect in both males and females in a variety of other tissues. The default is to be female because that's the environment you're growing up in. You're inside a mom who has a whole lot of pressure. Might be out of time now. Alright, so what we'll pick up with next time is going to be uh, we'll take a look at the ovarian cycle, what's happening in the ovary, and then we'll take a look at the uterine cycle, what's actually happening in the uterus.